Maybe I should add one thing, which is um, that uh, I am also presiding the chair of the scientific and um, strategic committee of the Institut de la Ville en Mouvement, the Institute of City of the Move, which is one of the co-organizers of this uh, conference. And for that reason, um, I have the honor also of presenting uh, the beginning of our program, which has been launched, and some of you may have attended that last, uh, last um, Sunday um, for the Passage. Actually, I'm quite honored uh, to be here and also to be in this session, because I have a feeling that what I'm going to try to convey to you is going to be very closely linked to what both Seta Lowe and especially Margaret Crawford have been saying. Uh, except, as you have heard, I am a designer, which means that I would like to reverse that and to uh, tell you or at least convey to you some of the elements which, in my opinion, will create some of the conditions necessary to have this everyday urbanism being constituted. Let's look at our cities today and what happened. In one word, you could say that from the war, uh, last war on, in our modern cities, engineers have systematically built infrastructures with their own logic. Um, and we have scales, the trains have a certain logic, the cars, the, uh, the, VRT, the BRT has a certain logic and so forth, and they become independent systems with their own logic. So um, even when we create new hierarchies in our cities, what we basically see is that they uh, become an independent system. And Buenos Aires, is one of the many towns that really demonstrates quite clearly this idea. Uh, as you see, there is a clear hierarchy in the road system. Uh, we have uh, detached and desolated uh, train lines, uh, and we have now also a rather solitary conception of the new BRT on its own track. What we have also is, of course, that this constitution of these new layers of infrastructure adds to creating barriers in the urban tissues. And we should be aware that this is not something we are only discovering today. Voluntarily, I put in two books, but there's many more that go back to the late 50s and early 60s that only already talk about how cities are being destroyed by these large motorways and that really bring about these pictures of detrimental situations. And we shouldn't forget that we have been acting already on them. Two instances here, for instance, the A1 motorway north of Paris and, of course, the Boston Dick motorway, you know, the, the, the big dick, uh, that have already uh, been uh, put into a tunnel with a new landscape on top of it. So, if we think about this double condition, both, you know, separated fields of layers that are not communicating and other, you know, new uh, barriers that are created, we think that this idea which we would like to advocate of passages, is an extremely important idea on two levels. The first is that we, have the, we can connect the horizontal planes by small incidental uh, vertical links. And so we actually combine, uh, by combining uh, the systems, the different systems, we establish a much larger network. So this is what we usually call intermodality, and it can be organized in a rather blunt sense, like in this example, just making passages between 
the rail and the buses, or in a more sophisticated way, like this example in Zurich, you know, doing actually the same thing and creating an urban space while doing it. On the other hand, we see, of course, that we need, the, we have these conflicts uh, between the barriers and the, 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 the streams of communication that have to pass the barriers. And usually what we have done, we as societies, uh, we have given prevalence to the stronger, to the car in this case, and put the pedestrian on top or below. And uh, this has been done in many different fashions. To the left, as you see, in very rudimentary ways, what is usually the case sometimes with a little more designerly sophistication as on the right. So let's try to first think how, you know, these, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, an idea of a problem, to see the passage as a problem-solving device, how it has evolved in time. Well, originally you could say, and these examples show it, that the infrastructures of an other category, you know, were made compatible to the existing urban textures. And the streets kept on passing through, even though the other was more, uh, more present. Afterwards, I would say, uh, with uh, the, the advent uh, of the modernism, uh, especially after the Second World War, we come to situations where these opportunities of crossings are only made there where it is absolutely needed, like every 500 meters, and it really doesn't always correspond to the existing network underneath. And what do you have? You get a deterioration, which is due to this wrong implantation and the fear of being used. So these technocratic passages, in our opinion, failed as a problem-solving device. They failed because of the recurrent uh, idea of a narrow tunnel with blinded edges. Uh, they inspire a derelict sense of abandonment claimed by marginalized users. And so um, they... Uh, uh, what do we do uh, then to overcome that? Because, of course, many authorities today have already witnessed that there are problems with these passages and they have to do something. So let's first over, have an overview of what is the usual attitudes, the recurrent way of improvement we already encounter. The first has to do with what I would call beautification beautification by an artistic decoration or a wall treatment, which can be, you know, merely having a painting or a picture. It can also be creating an exhibit in this passage or, like uh, you see on the right, uh, having a possibility of scanning what you need for uh, your shopping and they bring it then back at your own home. Um, what is very used is also the light effect, of course, you know, light effect, which can be something that changes over time, like in Shanghai in this uh, touristic uh, train tunnel, or uh, something that changes throughout the length of the tunnel and becomes really a sort of uh, uh, an artistic installation. Most of the time, what is being used is architecture. Architecture in the sense of creating a beautiful object. This is what designers try to do and then think that they have solved everything while doing that. And um, trying to, to mark the transition that it creates by underlining it, by embellishing it, by beautifying. So, I think this, oh, I hope this overview of recurrent design attitudes intended to improve the dreariness of existing technocratic passages shows the limits of formal beautification. It means that we need to go beyond form in order 
to create social meaning. Or rather, that we should investigate how the significance of form can be perceived as a meaningful public space. And in order to do so, I propose to return to the key elements contained in the original meaning of the word passage. And they, these original meanings, in our view, appear as well in the primitive passages, which were created by the manifold practice of inhabiting the land as by the modern passages designed in the 19th century as real estate objects attracting investments by the new combination of activities they offered. So what are these characteristics? Um, well, first of all, as you say, they establish a shortcut by allowing to cross the barrier. But they also uh, create, they are really only accessible for those who can master the dangers. Think about the boat people who are trying to come to a new land and they have to know how the sea works in order to be able to arrive. Or these instructors teaching people how to climb mountains. And these rules are often, you know, posed by the people who are already there, by the residents and they create a space in which the others are allowed. And third element, very important, is that the passage is usually symbolizing a transition between two worlds, the inner and the outer, the, 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 the rich and the poor, the periphery and the center. This, let's go to the 19th century meaning uh, about how this word was interpreted. We see very often that in the 19th century, throughout these different blocks, we created, you know, pathways in order to shorten and create a shortcut. But this transition also marked a difference between inner and outer. Um, and so uh, it also led to a diversity which was directed towards informed customers. Those who knew what to get in a certain passage uh, would come there. So the passages specialized both in amenities and both in publics. But beyond that, it's, they were accessible for all and they remained a genuine public real. So in principle, and somewhat simplifying for the purpose of this presentation, we tend to notice three reoccurring important criteria that can help us to re-articulate what would be a meaningful passage today. The first, it should be a shortcut or perceived as such because otherwise people will not use it because they will not just walk longer. The second is it should be a transition or a middle ground between socially differing worlds. And the third, it should be accessible to all, yet drawing their particular character from the nature of the embedded activities and the habits of the so-called regulars. These three criteria can help us to identify what are the innovative attitudes towards passage today. Beyond the means we already distinguished of simply beautifying, we notice two basic design attitudes towards creating innovative passages today. One is the attracting of activities or the giving evidence to particular pieces uh, in order to, you, to, 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 to make you know, the itinerary readable and have it uh, as an important part in the mind of people. And the second is to identify optional crossings as emblematic gatherings uh, for uh, gathering spaces for the neighborhood and highlight initially unobtrusive 
connections as iconic urban spaces. So I'll give you a run through quickly through a few examples to show you more clearly what I mean by that. Uh, we all know the transformation of passages in the underground into commercial zones or the passages of uh, uh, you know, the galleries into commercial zones. That's obvious. But sometimes we see that we create, uh, uh, we mark a figure in the urban panorama and that, in that way we accentuate the unicity of a certain trajectory, uh, be it by what you saw, be it by an urban lift, like in Pamplona, this example, or be it like in London, uh, the, the walk, you know, from north to left bank, you see St. Paul's on the left, you know, uh, which, where the Millennium Bridge becomes an important passage. Or in Toronto, you know, the crossing of the uh, Humber River uh, along the, the, the lake side. Or in uh, Madrid, you know, where you, know, you have the passage of Dominique Perrault, which is so exclusive, that it be so interesting that it becomes uh, something in the mind of people. Think about these um, places like the Promenade Plante in Paris, you know, near the Bastille. You have two options. You can go both on the top of this uh, viaduct that was initially a train viaduct and is now a walkway, or you can go down. But the fact that if you go up, it becomes so much of a, a scene where you can see everything in a panorama that the whole district is then being identified by this unique panorama. The same goes for the High Line in New York. Uh, because, you know, the High Line gives you a sort of a, an observation point, a panorama, which uh, creates a completely other kind of vision of this district than would be going down on the lower places. So it becomes uh, iconic for, its, uh, re for the district renovation. Sometimes lesser known examples. In Saint-Nazaire in France, you can go on top of the German uh, U-boat uh, base, and by doing that, you have an observation of the whole city, and this becomes an important gathering place. Or in the Guayaquil, the Malecon del Salgado, which is just a new walkway along the riverfront, which uh, passes by the initial quarter, but because of that, becomes the meeting place of the neighboring district, also because of its clear form, you see the guitar which is uh, laid out. Or in this case, you know, Bangkok, where you have a, a junction between the Sky train station surrounding four shopping malls and becoming a vestibule for customers. Um, and of course, in Hong Kong, the mechanical stairs, you have both the option of the normal stairs or the mechanical stairs, which become much more than just transportation. They become a point of residence and a real public space. And of course, you know, uh, depends on what you want to join. And the point is that often this junction is between two parts, like in this case, two parts of a university where the bridge at the junction, the passage, becomes actually iconic for the university as such. And I want to end with a couple of examples of South America which we absolutely think are memorable and are teaching most of the rest of the world. You know, in the case of the Medellin Metrocal, uh, whereby the higher city is linked to the lower city, and whereby in between, because of the bibliotheque, you know, the three black volumes, the library, uh, you get this meeting point where poorer and richer people get to have an encounter and it gets to be the real town. The same happens in Medellin, more or less, with the escalators of housing district number 31, where the middle, the plateaus in between also become places where, you know, different kind of people start to mingle, commerce start to be attracted, etc. And maybe... Uh, to end with, we could look at this uh, uh, escalator in uh, Rio, which is one of the 
places. Uh, on, uh, on the bottom of it is a metro station, and so it links one of the favelas to this metro station. In itself, interesting, but what is really interesting is the platform you have on top, because this is right on top of Ipanema Beach, and it means that both residents of the favela and people that are looking, want to look at the, at the Ipanema uh, go to intermingle in this place. So I conclude. These examples show how small interventions can really extend beyond their normal reach. By realizing strategic connections, they do away with barriers and complete the missing pieces of an integrated transport network that encompasses the city as a whole. By opening up the disenchanted housing districts, these passages allow their deprived inhabitants to reach destinations that were formerly inaccessible to them and help them to become citizens in the full sense of the word. That is why the implementation of such passages constitutes one of the big challenges of our contemporary urban world. And our IVM program that we are opening these days in Buenos Aires specifically ambitions to push the reflection on how these passages should be realized in the context of different demonstrating pro demonstrator projects around the world. Thank you very much for your